to the What Bitcoin Did podcast. I'm Whit Diffie. I'd like to welcome you to the What Bitcoin Did podcast. Simply the best Bitcoin podcast in Bedford. Yes, that's Whitfield Diffie, and I'm Peter McCormack, and you are listening to the What Bitcoin Did podcast. But before you hear from that absolute legend in cryptography, I first have a message from my show sponsors. If you're interested in a crypto back loan, well, BlockFi is the leading crypto to USD lender, servicing customers worldwide, including 47 US states, and their interest rates start as low as 4.5%. Also, BlockFi accepts Bitcoin, Ether, or Litecoin as collateral. Customers can be funded in USD or GUSD, which is Gemini's dollar-backed stablecoin, and you can go from application to funding in as little as 30 minutes. If you sign up at BlockFi.com forward slash what Bitcoin did, you can get $25 in free crypto added to customer collateral loans for under $10,000, or $50 in free crypto added to customer collateral loans over $10,000, and applying takes less than two minutes. And what about my other lead sponsor, Paxful? Have you checked them out yet? Give yourself a minute, head over to their website and find out why they are a proper Bitcoin company offering the most comprehensive options available for buying Bitcoin. They accept bank transfers, debit and credit cards, PayPal, Western Union. We're talking about over 300 different payment options for buying Bitcoin. All are listed on their website, so make sure you go and check it out. They are a true peer-to-peer Bitcoin marketplace. They have a full service escrow system and they offer 24-7 customer support. These guys are seriously awesome. Go and check them out at Paxful.com, which is P-A-X-F-U-L.com. That is Paxful.com. So on to my interview with Whitfield Diffie. And some of you may not know who he is, but Whitfield is one of the fathers of cryptography, an absolute legend who created the foundations for what cryptocurrencies are built on. I've wanted to interview him for ages. He's one of those people I haven't seen do too many interviews, but I was introduced to him by David Chaum, another absolute legend in cryptography. And this was one of those interviews I knew I had to do in person. So when I was heading out to San Francisco, I reached out to Whitfield and we met up in Palo Alto. We had breakfast and then we recorded. Genuinely, this is one of the most enjoyable interviews I've ever done. And even though I was an hour late, he was really nice with me. And I think we've recorded probably one of my favorite shows ever. You know, if you have any questions, you can reach out to me. My email address is hello at whatbitcoindid.com. And listen, if you want to support the show, there's a section on my website which explains everything. If you head over to www.whatbitcoindid.com, you can click on the support section and find out some of the things you can do. I also need to say a big thank you to my Patreon top tier sponsors. I've got three of them. Firstly, we've got Elite Crypto Consulting, your personalized trading teacher. Secondly, we have vidyen.com, who offer WordPress plugins for advertising and Monero mining reward sites, which is vidyen.com, and honeyminer.com, who make mining and earning money simple for anyone with a computer. Thank you all. Thank you for being Patreon top tier sponsors. Okay, so on to the interview. And as I've said, if you've got any questions, feel free to reach out to me. My email address is hello at whatbitcoindid.com. Good morning, Wit. How are you? Good morning. I'm fine. How are you? I'm very good, thank you. So my podcast has been known to have the almost the who's who in the Bitcoin world. Um, I've been very fortunate to have some great guests on, but I've told people that (laughs) now you're adding who's nobody in the Bitcoin world. No, not at all. Actually, you know, I mean, something in some world, but not particularly the Bitcoin world. No, you say that. I've I was telling people the whole time. Like, I must have told about 10 people I'm coming to interview you. And every single time, their eyes have lit up uh, with pure excitement. And because you have this kind of name, the the father of cryptography, how do you feel about that? Oh, uh, it's really much easier growing old being a success than everybody makes a fuss over me. At, uh, I enjoy it. Oh, good. And you, you got to, you were on stage at Consensus last year, weren't you, with Zuko? Yes. How was that? It, of course, it was great, but it was not. It was neither. A, the subject matter wasn't either as close to my heart as some, or you know, you're talking to thousands of people. It's uh, it's a it's a, it's an on stage experience. I some of them some of them are great. That one just strikes me as you know something I did. Yeah, and I guess this boom in cryptocurrencies is. I kind of probably came out of nowhere for you and then suddenly brought all your work and the history of everything you've done. uh, It's like a second wave. Or third. Third wave. Okay. Yeah, because uh, there's a big explosion. I mean, we had cryptography up till 1990, but then suddenly in the 1990s with transport layer security and stuff, there was a big explosion. Of course, yeah. And then there's been, been 
you know, ongoing enthusiasm about things like homomorphic encryption and multi-party computation and things like that. And then all of a sudden, yeah, cryptocurrencies come on and that's, my gosh, you know, we thought we'd solve this problem and now here everybody is enthusiastic about it. Yeah, I mean the the excitement, especially over the last year or so, is it's been like it's just been huge. It's been like this explosion of excitement. Um, so I've got lots and lots I want to talk to you about, but I think it'd be really cool for you to tell me what you told me over breakfast this morning because you told me a very interesting thing about the date you were born and then kind of like your life journey. Ah. I think it's a really interesting story. Do you mind? Do you mind me telling no. that? Um, I was born. The day before D-Day in Washington, D.C., and would have been D-Day, except the invasion was postponed one day because of the weather. But as it turns out, that meant I was born almost exactly at the uh, time that the first signals intelligence deception started against the Germans. They uh, dropped what uh, what the Brits call window and the Yanks call chaff, out over the out over the channel, simulating a large flight of aircraft by a small number of aircraft that are dropping stuff that shows up very well on the radar, and so I, at some point, somebody asked me, you know, this kind of question: What can you tell us about yourself? And I came up with this. And I said, you know, most people, lots of people, believe in astrology, the notion that the stars affect your life. But I have this notion of terrestrology. It's celestial events that, uh, not celestial, terrestrial events that uh, affect your life. And so I figured the course of my life was set by the by the things that were going on at the moment of my birth. That's incredible. <laughs> That's incredible. Okay, and mm-hmm. well, then maybe, because wasn't it about 1976, was it, where you wrote that very important white paper? Yes. And then that was... It was published November 76. 76, okay. So that was a couple of years before I was born. And, and now here we are now. So maybe like that was some kind of... You set something in motion for my life. And that's why I discovered <laughs> cryptography. And we both ended up here. Right. In Palo Alto talking about this. Okay, so can you then tell me... Because I think other people are going to find it really interesting. Like, what's the journey to uh, becoming a cryptographer? Like, uh, what were the things that kind of sparked your interest growing up and then what happened kind of like the college process that got you to that point? Well, the journey is probably a funny way to put it in the sense that mine will will have been very different from anything anybody does today. Uh, in the 60s, I was working uh, at the art of... I was being paid by, my, by an outfit called Mito Corporation, but I was the guest of, of Minsky's Artificial Intelligence Lab at MIT to work on symbolic mathematical manipulation, things that take your calculus course for you or something like that. And we were in the same building with the Multics Project, which is the most ambitious operating system project of all time. And it had all sorts of fancy file protection mechanisms and things like that. And I thought about that, and my response was, well, what good is that? Because the system programmers, I didn't know, I didn't distinguish between those and the operators at that time, though that distinction was already clear in the industrial world. System programmers aren't going to, aren't going to, you know, go to jail to protect your files. If a subpoena comes in for your files, you know, they'll just hand them over. And as you can see, I already had a very, you know, a very countercultural viewpoint at that time. So my, my notion now seems naive, although the basic thing is still the subject of a big fight. Um, was, oh, if you encrypt your files, then only you can get at them, and it's all right that they're sitting there on the disk. So, but I was thought I was working on something more important. I was moving into working on proof of correctness of programs, and that was, in my opinion, was then and is now the most important problem in engineering. Um, And so I didn't work on cryptography myself. I tried to persuade friends to work on it. And 
my view was, you know, I knew the government knew a lot about it and didn't want to tell us about it. And I figured it could be rediscovered. And so I tried to talk a number of friends who since wished they had been talked into working on it, but nothing much happened. And I moved out here to Stanford to work with John McCarthy, who was the the person who really understood what I understood about the importance of proof of correctness. And I did that, worked on that for, I guess it's roughly speaking, you know, two and a half, three years before I was rescued by a blessed event. Larry Roberts, who died a few weeks ago, was the funder of the ARPANET. And he went up to NSA to talk to the to Howard Rosenblum, who was the deputy director for research. And I wasn't present at that conversation, but roughly speaking, they, they must have said, you know, Robert said, I have a $100 million a year military communications research project, and we ought to give some thought to security. And I can't see that they disagreed on that, but I think it came apart over the fact that that part of ARPA was very open and didn't want to support any classified research, and Howard Rosenblum didn't want to do anything else. And so Larry Roberts went back to his office in uh, Roslyn, and he had a job where his principal investigators came by with their hats in their hands and had to talk about anything he wanted to talk about. So that week he was talking about network security, and at that time we all thought network security meant cryptography, and John McCarthy got excited about this. He could talk to him, got excited about this, came back out to California, chatted us up at the lab on the subject. And two of us at least got got interested in it. The other one was Hans Moravec, who is now head of the robot laboratory, or maybe he's retired, but he's head of the robot laboratory at CMU. And John had designed a crypto system, what would now be called, much later be called a shrinking generator. One, one, one sequence generator picks bits out of another one. And he had got Moravec to code it for him. And Moravec introduced something that's later called key escrow. That is, he reasoned, well, if my thesis advisor wants to encrypt something, I might want to know what it is. So his program hid the key where he could find it. Um, and he stayed interested for a week or two or something like that. Six weeks later, I, six months later, I was doing nothing else. And John was fed up to his back teeth because I was being supported by under-the-table money from NSA, the National Security Agency, the, the cryptographic people, to work on proof of correctness, which they were big champions then and still are. Um, so we negotiated an amicable parting of the ways, and I went off traveling around the country uh, thinking about these problems and talking to anybody who was willing to talk and digging up rare manuscripts in libraries. And this process, my first discovery in this process of my wife, Mary Fisher, who died a couple of years ago. And without, without that discovery, I don't think I would have made any of the others. But she and I then traveled for a couple of years. And the next great event is the summer of 74. We went to Yorktown Heights to see a man named Alan Tritter, who called himself the biggest man in computer science, weighed 500 pounds. And he was a notorious <laughs> phone freak and hacker. And he introduced me to his boss, Alan Conheim, who's a statistician and was head of the mathematics department uh, at, Yorktown, at Yorktown Heights. And was that was one of the key elements in producing what later came out as the data encryption standard, the first pretty good uh, public cryptographic standard. And so Conheim only told me one thing. He was very secretive. He only told me one thing, and since then he's wished he never said that. And, well, you know, I can't tell you anything. We're under a secrecy order here. But you go out back out to Stanford, you should look up my old friend Marty Hellman because he's interested in this stuff, and two people can work on a problem better than one. Um, and, and that's interesting for a couple of reasons. I mean, the reason he wished he'd never said it was we became a great pain in his ass, uh, 
and uh, because we 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 thought we thought that the data encryption wasn't strong enough. In retrospect, I'm not sure that, that was that was the right conclusion, but we we thought it should have had more key bits, and uh, we delayed its adoption perhaps for a couple of years. Um, but Conheim, nonetheless, despite saying that, he had a fundamentally scientific orientation. If he'd been an NSA guy, he wouldn't have done anything, you know, he would have done things to mislead me and certainly wouldn't have connected with some somebody else working on the problem. Hey, Amen. I came back out here to Stanford and uh, I find it amusing the small world department. Mary and I were staying with a man named Leslie Lamport, who won the Turing Award two years before I did. And he has lived up in Oakland. And we uh, I called Marty Hellman down at Stanford, and he graciously granted me half an hour of his time from 4.30 to 5 some afternoon. And Mary and I drove down here, and she took off and went off with the car and wisely didn't bother calling back until around 5.30 or so. But she called in, and at, we were still talking, and Marty invited us over to his house for dinner. And uh, that, that's what began. That, that was a wonderful evening. As families, we got along very well, and that began four years of work together. Uh, that's what led to public key cryptography. Wow. That's <laughs> some story. So I came here really to thank you for the work, but Sounds like it's actually Mary we need to thank because you're saying it wouldn't well, have happened I, without her. I, I think that I think that's right. Almost everybody loved Mary, and that meant people put up with me in order to get her co company. Almost so. That sounds like she had an edge. No, it's not about her having an edge. It's not you know, it's hard to fool all the people all the time, as Lincoln <laughs> said. Uh, there were people who didn't weren't taken with her, but most people were. But what did, what was it about her that? enabled you to like work on these projects and what 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 did she make happen for you well for example i think my i think i think she she deserves a lot of credit for my relationship with marty hellman right okay, okay? and for my people are typically people thank their partners for their emotional support Mm -hmm. right? And I, I said when I gave her obituary at RSA, I said I was very grateful for her irrational enthusiasm for whatever I was doing. Uh, but uh, as my view that people – that I got a lot of credit – a lot of credit for how charming she was and she opened a lot of doors for me. Wow. So it's a really nice way to hear you talk about her. Okay. So what was the key breakthrough – in cryptography like what was the moment where you realized okay we're onto something here because there's lots of different and also there's lots of different types of cryptography like try and help me as somebody who doesn't okay. understand so, it. so i like every other mathematician who ever went into cryptography right oh <laughs> that might be an exaggeration but not much i went in thinking oh gosh this is a mess i'm going to clean this up we're going to have proofs that systems are secure we'll develop a theory of the subject and we won't have a sort of an ad hoc, you know, proposing things, trying to break them. We'll like them if we can't break them, that sort of thing. And I had got nowhere. Nobody's gotten anywhere with that yet. So I was saying I had a list of what I called ambitious problems in cryptography that were actually, you know, because I didn't imagine any of them were going to make any progress soon, that was easier to think about. And one of them was an attempt to combine two things. So something that was very important that I had, I had discovered and discovered somebody who worked on was what's called identification friend or foe. So the, you imagine a fire control radar. That is, it's you know, sweep radar finds aircraft and then a fire control radar looks at them and then it has to, roughly speaking, you're going to, it's going to tell the gun whether to take a shot at it or not. And a fire control radar um, issues, some, issues a challenge to an aircraft and roughly speaking says, if you can encrypt, you know, 
If you can read this challenge and re-encrypt it correctly and send it back to me, I'll refrain from telling the gun to shoot at you. Now, the way that works, that's very important what that does, is it keeps somebody who overhears the challenge and response from responding to another challenge. If the plane just had a password, which is what they did circa World War II and a good bit later, then if you were able to intercept one such exchange, then you could reuse it for quite some length of time. But early 1950s, the Air Force Cambridge Research Lab, the root of many things in cryptography, uh, worked on that problem and produced something that's used worldwide now with many crypto systems called the Mark 12 IFF. And in effect, that scheme pr protects you from shoulder surfing. You can do this challenge and response in public, everybody can listen to it, and still they don't learn anything about how to spoof you. So I was trying to combine that with something else, which is what uh, is used um, in Unix uh, password login. Um, although, in fact, it was developed, I think it was developed at Cambridge uh, somewhat earlier. Um, and that is that the password table doesn't need to be secret. So you only store encrypted passwords in the password table, and when you get a password typed in, you encrypt it, and you compare that with what's in the table. Now, yes, many of your listeners will respond, oh, wait, but there are lots of problems with that, and there have been. But at the time, that was thought of as revolutionary, and it was thought to be adequate, and so forth. So I was trying to combine these two things, and at some point, well, I should go back a little, because... Two problems that dominated, had, had been hanging around in my life. In 1965, a, uh, a classmate named Bill Mann mistakenly told me that the NSA encrypted the telephones within its own building. And it started, turns out, you know, he was mistaken. They don't, they didn't do, they barely did any of that now, and they don't do that much of that then. I'm sorry, they barely did any of it then. They don't do that much of it now. Um, they have two sets of phones, and they have, you know, protected conduit and so forth. But I just got to thinking about this, and I can understand how you could do it, but I couldn't, I had such a, I said I had a countercultural viewpoint. What I didn't understand was what you'd gain from it. Because my notion of a private telephone conversation was, I call somebody, and the person I called and I are the only people in the world who can understand this conversation, right? No, and I, I just didn't have the institutional point of view at all. NSA could perfectly well encrypt all, all the calls within its own building with the same key and get lots of benefit against its, its enemies, which it considered to be outside its building. But in any event, so I began thinking about what it now called the key distribution problem. And then in 1970, just after I'd arrived at Stanford, John McCarthy went and gave a talk in Bordeaux about what we would now call internet commerce. He called it buying and selling through home terminals. And what he proposed, I don't know if there's any influence on it, but what he proposed is sort of like the French Minitel, uh, which came along a few years later. And so I began thinking about automated offices and I couldn't see what you did about signature. We depended so heavily on signatures in office memos and so forth. And we depend on a, sig a written signature. We depend so heavily on the fact that it's hard to copy. And you can always copy digital signals precisely. So I had been had these two problems hanging around in my mind for quite a while. And I realized you could solve the second one that the fact that you could, could recognize a correct solution to a problem didn't mean that you were able to solve it. And I, I took note of that and, you know, didn't know how to do it, but I liked that idea. And about a week later, I realized that if you could do that, you could turn it around to solve the problem I'd been thinking about for 15 years, which was how to negotiate keys I'm putting it in a little more modern terminology, but mm -hmm. how to negotiate keys between people who've never met before. And so 
you know, Stephen Levy has written this, wrote, wrote this account up in his book, Crypto, and that's the key. I did one good hour of work in my life. I've been making a living off of it ever since. <laughs> I think it's a little more than that. Or an hour and a half. No? An hour and a half. At any time during uh, your work prior to cryptocurrencies, had the thought of crypto uh, in relation to money come up? Oh, yes, Absolutely. In particular, I mean, you mentioned having talked to David Chaum. Yeah. I believe I may have gotten him interested in that. I think it's either 76 or 78. We could figure it out. 78 Walking. would be perfect on your thesis then because that was the year I was born. Okay. Right. Uh, just <laughs> at the moment. We're, okay. So we with the, the, at that time, there was something called the National Computer Conference that was held once or twice a year in the U.S., and quite a big conference then. It got too big to be held. I mean, it no longer exists, but it was in New York, and David and I were there, and we, it probably is 78. We walked uptown to somewhere. I don't remember where, but I was talking to him about such things. Imagine a digital traveler's check, which works by having what's now called a message digest or secure hash algorithm. And so what's on the traveler's check is the output of the hash code, right? So we have SHA-2 of something written on the traveler's check. And if you know how to produce the input that'll produce that SHA-2, then you can cash the traveler's check. And he got, I believe that's, you know, a significant, that kind of, that just, our discussion is a significant part of what got him into uh, into worrying about banking and cryptocurrencies and things of that kind. I never, I never, I never resonated with it. But you did go to some of the early cypherpunk meetings. We talked about that earlier, and it must it, was it coming up in those meetings? Well, it must have. I don't. As I as I, I remember, you know, cypherpunks. Being in favor of using cryptography, yeah. Being very, somebody wrote, I think it's plausible that at the core of Cypherpunk's work was anonymous remailers. Um, they were, they had a police, a, a poli so to speak, the political action of a Cypherpunk was to write code, was sort of an in principle notion, um, and I am sure, I'm sure that money did figure, you know. Cryptographic money did figure in it, but I don't remember any detail. Okay, so David obviously worked on DigiCash. Yes. Ultimately failed, but it, I think its failure was good for Bitcoin because it proved, it was like another part of the ingredient of what Bitcoin needed to make a success. Um, so I was with Peter Todd early in, in the week, and we did an episode, We call, I called it The Essence of Bitcoin, where he, he talked about all the different things that made Bitcoin work. And I, I guess DigiCash proves that it's something it couldn't work if it was centralized. Um, well, I think it must achieve different results if it's centralized. Yeah, and certainly, you know, there's a. I I, I don't I do not know the technical reasons DigiCash failed, uh, but I think that. Chaum and his school explored a vast range of things in this space that you could do. And Bitcoin, the development of Bitcoin had the advantage of being able to, you know, go to the library and read these things rather than having to discover all of them. So, yeah. so you, and David laid the foundation for this subject. You first discovered, you first heard about Bitcoin where at the place we had breakfast this morning, right? Yes. Your favorite cafe. Um, yes, I was sitting at a table that no longer is, there's no longer a table in that spot, but it was right next to where we were this morning. Yeah. And uh, John Markoff, uh, of the, then of the New York Times, walked in, sat down, and he had the Bitcoin paper, and he explained it to me. And... I'm ashamed to say I didn't read far enough in it or something or didn't explore far enough to learn that I could just download some code and mine Bitcoin because what I was fascinated with was not the transaction mechanism but the mining. 
And it struck me this was a very natural discovery that you could invest com computation in manufacturing something that was valuable. And that struck me as exactly like prospecting and panning or something for gold. I, you know, many things about it, of course, I didn't see. But, uh, yeah, I, so I have the grace and disgrace of having known about this circa 2009, 2010, but not having done anything much about it except uh, talk to people about it. I, th I think a lot of people have been through that, though. I mean, I remember in 2013, and I think a Bitcoin was about $100, and I thought that's... That's too expensive. And I think I bought one or two and then sold them. And, uh -huh. you know, look where we are now. Um, and uh, across my interviews, there's, there's like a huge amount of stories like this. When I interviewed Peter Todd the other day, he said his greatest ever investment was buying Bitcoin at 20 cents. And his uh, greatest fail failed investment was only buying $20 worth. <laughs> <laughs> so have you, ever, have you ever used Bitcoin? No. You've never used it? No, that cafe we were at, Cooper, uh, used to take Bitcoin. Right, uh, but uh, they they have a new cash register system with other other virtues, and I don't think Bitcoin was good enough for them that uh, John Paul the Younger has bothered to code it for the new cash register. So I used to be able to keep up with the value of Bitcoin because the screen would tell me that my cup of coffee was worth you know one one millionth of a Bitcoin or whatever it was uh, ten thousandths. Uh, Day and I, so I could watch how Bitcoin moved around <laughs> by how much my breakfast was worth if I wanted to pay in Bitcoin. And there was some app that ran on smartphones that you could pay in Bitcoin with, but I never did it. Have you maintained much of an interest in it, to, and, or have you kept kind of like an arm's length distance? Well, I, I one, I am fascinated with it in the yeah. sense that it's it's rare for first implementations of such broad concepts to do as well as that did, right? So Bitcoin is still here, you know, nearly 10 years after it started out. Uh, it is, there's a fortune, I don't know what the total value of Bitcoin is, but a whole, probably there's more involved than is reflected by, so to speak, the market cap. Because lots of people are now making careers off of der derivative phenomena. And I think, I think blockchain is a fascinating phenomenon, um, much broader than Bitcoin. Right, okay. Um, I am... If you look at the whole lifetime experience of Bitcoin, it has too high a beta, too high a variation to make very good currency. Right? So in, we, in one sense, this direction has until maybe recently. It's stabilized a good bit, I understand, in the last few months. But you have to ask yourself, what would make, and it's a fascinating commodity to invest in, but what makes such a commodity volatile or stable? And I don't know if that question has been answered yet. No, it, it hasn't. There are different, people have different uh, theories, like uh, once you have more liquidity, say it's traded more around the world by institutions, then it will become more of a stable price. Or as it grows, the price becomes more stable. I mean, I don't know. I sometimes think Bitcoiners invent future scenarios to justify the current situation. So, Oh, no doubt. <laughs> I mean, there's probably a parallel. I'll bet, you, I'll bet you can find articles, you know, varying from op-eds to, to journal articles about the euro. Uh making predictions about how it would win, lose, be stable, be fl fluctuate, etc., depending on the interests of the people writing the articles. So, yeah, uh, of course. Next up, I talked to Whitfield Moore about the history of cryptography and his views on Bitcoin. But before that, I have a message from my show sponsors. So you all know about BlockFi, right? But have you really checked them out? Have you followed them on Twitter? Have you signed up to their newsletter? If you are not following them, then you are missing out on the future of cryptocurrencies and banking. Also, as I've told you, they've extended their sponsorship with the podcast, which is amazing. So a big thank you to them for that. 
So much has happened for them since they've been sponsoring the show. Zach Prince came on the podcast. He's the CEO. That was episode 51. You should definitely check that one out if you haven't. He talks about reshaping the future of banking with crypto. They also raised an additional $4 million of funding, which will be used to expand their team and launch exciting new products, which are coming soon. They've got a crypto savings account, which earns interest and crypto backed credit cards. They've also added support for Litecoin as collateral and stable coins as a funding option. So much other really cool stuff. But listen, if you are interested in a crypto backed loan, well, BlockFi is the leading crypto to USD lender servicing customers worldwide, including 47 US states, and their interest rates start as low as 4.5%. If you sign up at BlockFi.com forward slash what Bitcoin did, you can get $25 in free crypto added to customer collateral loans under $10,000 or $50 in free crypto added to customer collateral loans over $10,000. And applying takes less than two minutes. And I also want to tell you about my buddies over at Honeyminer. Are you interested in getting into mining? If you are, you should definitely check them out. They were one of the first advertisers on the show, and they also had a massive announcement recently. They now support Linux. So if you've ever wanted to get into crypto mining, but I've got no idea how, well, Honeyminer is a great first way for you to do it. They've got a one-click install software, which starts earning you Bitcoin straight to your computer. They support Windows and Linux, with Macs coming soon, but let's talk about Linux as this has just come to market. Compatible with Ubuntu 16.04, Ubuntu 18.04, or Cent. OS7, Honeyminer Max pays out market value plus 10%. As with all mining, payouts may fluctuate with each payout period of two hours, but should average out to be 10% greater than open market earnings. Sounds cool. Are you interested? Well, if you want to start mining with Honeyminer, head over to honeyminer.com forward slash labs. Um, where in life do people use cryptography without even realizing it where is it well like- wait, wait. far and away the most common is in in doing so many things on on the web right um you know it used to be the well transport layer security what used to be called ssl is the most widespread use of cryptography the world has ever seen um it used to be that when the military were the big customers when they bought a lot of something, they bought 100,000 or possibly a million of them. There are some cryptographic devices in the U.S. and British inventories of which they bought hundreds of thousands. Uh, there are billion, the uh, S- t- Transport layer security is in every browser. There are billions of them in the world. Right? So the total... The total amount of encryption that's done by the ordinary process of paying for things on the web or just using security conscious things like Google products on the web, right, gets you involved in using cryptography. And of course, you don't know it because you would rather, you know, it's a tedious thing to have to know about that. And uh, so, yes, I would suspect that almost everybody, um, has has some contact with it. There are other directions that are different. I mean, a uh, a GSM telephone, which is one aspect of all of them now, uh, encrypts the signal from the telephone to the base station. Mm-hmm. Um, and that gives you another thing. People have no reason to notice and use constantly. How would the world be different if there was no cryptography? If it had a problem that hadn't been solved? Well, I think a lot of things about web usage would be different. That is, there are ways at present. Well, look at okay, look at um, look at something about old telephone practice, which is that you really couldn't tell who was calling you, right? So lots of places that did what's in the military jargon, command and control, that is, they were ordering things to happen over the telephone, somebody would call in to do something and they would call them back immediately. Right. So the person who's going to hand out the important piece of information wants to know exactly who it's going to. And even though they recognize the voice and this, that, or the other, they get better author- authenticity by having called the number themselves. Um, and so many things like uh, updates, one of the big uses of cryptography, and in particular something I get a lot of credit for called digital signatures, is used if you get, if Apple or Microsoft sends you an update for your computer, 
then they have signed it, and your computer can check and see that it came from an authorized source. If we didn't have that, then probably we would have to reorganize things so that what you get is a message saying there's an update you can get, and then what you do is you turn around and call Microsoft and get it. So there would be a whole lot more uh, traffic. Right, okay. And what are your personal feelings on privacy and surveillance? Privacy is a very complicated social phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And I think the term, there isn't a good terminology. So people say things like, I remember somebody writing a small towns and no friends of privacy or something like that. And I thought about that, and I think that's a fundamental mistake. And what I mean is that if you live in a small town, of course, people in the town know, know all sorts of things about you, right? But of course, you also know all sorts of things about them, right? And that you're answerable to each other. You're, right? Whereas... What we, when we talk about being worried about privacy in the modern world, we're worried about the fact there are institutions you don't know anything about. They're very good at keeping themselves secret. Right? Say the insurance companies. Right? Things that are found about about you, insurance companies are allowed to use to decide how much insurance. Employers are allowed to use to decide whether they'll hire you or not. So your whole life could be changed by things you don't know about that are a result of the fact that people are holding on to lots of information uh, about you that they get out of, you know, as it's now called, surveillance capitalism. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, do, I, I don't... Um, I am involved with lots of organizations or some organizations like the Electronic Privacy Information Center that use that word and are doing, I think, lots of good work. At the same time, I have many disagreements with them as to what um, a about privacy, because in particular, privacy has, has, is constantly evoked effectively as a mechanism of censorship. People will say, we can't tell you this because... You know, so we would violate so and so's privacy, and that gives them control of the information, mm -hmm. and that has become, I believe, a big phenomenon uh, in the modern world. That privacy is used as an excuse for for secrecy for people for whom it is convenient to keep the secrets, not really out of any interest in the people the information is about. And how do you feel about censorship? Well, I'm generally opposed to it. Uh huh. Apart from, you're generally opposed to this. And oh, I'm sorry. Well, could I construct a case in which I thought it was legitimate to censor something? Maybe. Yeah. But my prejudice is against it. Okay. Okay. So how long have you been out uh, here in uh, like Palo Alto, this kind of area, the Bay Area? Um, it's just, it'll be 50 years in the fall. 50 years. So you've witnessed the entire span of the technical uh, innovation for we've had with the internet, mobile, telephony. Well, I've met a lot of it. I mean, it's usually created a determine who taught in mid-century at Stanford. Uh -huh. And so it goes back to World War II and a radar lab here and stuff like that. But, um, yes, I've witnessed a great deal of it. How have you, like, how do you take it all in? And what's your kind of perspective of it all? Like, are, are you a big fan of technology? Well, I could hardly say that I'm not. Okay. Just that I'm not. I'm, it's a funny thing to, you know. I mean, I like if, one. I consider it inevitable. Right. Okay. Being a fan of something, right? I, it could happen more or less quickly, but um, it seems to me that people do what can be done. So as what can be done expands, people do it. And there's a famous, you know, there's a. There's a, there's a claim, I haven't checked it against a really authentic source, but that at some date, say 1500, uh, it was illegal to burn coal in London because of the atmospheric effects. 
You're only allowed to burn wood. And it was a very serious crime to burn coal. And a century later, everybody was burning coal because that was lots of it. It was cheaper and so forth. And that led to the era, you know, of the famous London fogs. Um, so it's, is every bit of technology good? No. Is technology inevitable? Seems mostly. And I guess cryptography is a key part of a lot of this technology now. Yeah, I, technology is very large. I mean, cryptography has played, as a surpri- to my mind, a surprisingly large role. But do you, as you see the growth in technology, you see advancements, do you, do you look at it differently? So, for example, when I now listen to a podcast, right, it doesn't matter whose podcast I'm listening to, I don't just listen to the interview I listen to how the interviewer interviews, right? I listen to how they uh, questions, but I notice the ums, the ahs, because sometimes I edit them out. So I notice things that other people don't. Are you notice things, are you aware of things happening and you're thinking, ah, that was built upon my work, or ah, this is where cryptography is used? Well, I'm not aware of it, but I'm sure that I do. <laughs> okay. Um, no, the thing I remember noticing, I noticed things that we did not, that we, you know, known unknowns, things we didn't see coming, right? And so, oh, and this is true in, for example, the area of laptop computers. Mm -hmm. So when uh, Alan Kay had this, was pushing this notion in the 70s, there were all sorts of obvious things that were missing. We didn't know how to have flat screen displays at that time. How would you have a compact, portable computer if you needed to lug a cathode ray tube around, right? And so things have bubbled up right, out, 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 of, out of the broad scope of technological work that, that I didn't know anything about the origins of. I didn't see that there was a direction of work that, that was going to lead to that. Right. We also seem to have a... Technology seems to have brought the world closer together, but at the same time, it seems to have brought nations, pushed nations away from each other. And there's a lot of... You know, I was reading last week about um, suspicions of, say, Chinese uh, um, hacking, and uh, we hear about North Korean hacking. So cryptography obviously plays a, a very important part in the world. How how important is it for world security? Oh, wait a moment. Let's go back to your okay. thesis, which is I'm, I'm not at all convinced that we, did, we weren't uh, xenophobic in my youth, <laughs> well before the modern round of technology. Of course. Right? I mean, we fought a war with China over, over Korea. Right? We no doubt had lots of bad things to say about them. We threatened them. Uh, so I don't know that uh, hostility between nations is, uh, is anything new. Um, that's fair. And one thing that's interesting, uh, there's a, uh, a wonderful book, Call I think the silent weapon, uh, history of communication communications and foreign affairs, eighteen fifty to nineteen fifty, a title somewhat like that, and it says I think it says that the Spanish American War around eighteen ninety five was the first war in which communications were fast enough that each capital was looking over the other's shoulder. Right? So there's a whole issue today of 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 attempting to keep things secret so that you can make decisions without your opponents knowing at the same time you do exactly what you're going to do. And there wasn't any great problem about that when it took weeks for a message, you know, an observer, whether you call it a spy or a reporter or or somebody in Washington, would learn what was, you know, was hear what was being said and write a letter home to London, and they would hear about what was being said. But, of course, it was weeks later, and by the time they heard in London, somebody would have, you know, sent out three divisions or something, do whatever it was. Whereas today, you know, CNN and Al Jazeera and all of the other competing networks are uh, telling you immediately anything that can be heard in the streets in other people's capitals. So I think that's one of the big effects 
is a manipulable awareness by the by populations of the activities of other populations. All right. All right, I'm going to move to... I'm going to segue to something completely different now, but quantum computing. Well, I managed to get I managed to get you away from your your steer you away from your question. That never got well, answered. Do, well, do you know what it is? It's like I'm trying to think how to word this question. I wonder if like if there was no cryptography, nations would have like have to have more honest relationships because they wouldn't have so many secrets. Or is cryptography good for security and therefore positive? It's a tough. I I, I don't know the the answer. Oh, so in the first place. Let me let me put that in another way, this, yeah. and put it back in a Cold War framework. Um, lots of lots of people of the left, and that would loosely include me, uh, are dislike the intelligence agencies in part because the intelligence agencies are very secretive. Mm -hmm. But the fact is, the function of the intelligence agencies is to limit the ability of nation states to keep secrets. So I considered they were a very good thing because particularly as I want the Cold War framework because I would have thought the, the worst possible thing was to have these two superpowers with lots of nuclear weapons not having any idea what the others were doing. Right? Yep. So I thought, I think of intelligence as a very stabilizing phenomenon in, uh, in international affairs. Now, uh, Suppose there were no cryptography. Well, in some sense, there really was none before the First World War. That is to say, there was, it was a minor security technique until you had radio. I mean, people did encrypt diplomatic messages and things like that, but mostly they guarded the diplomatic pouch. And once you had radio, you had a communications phenomenon so wonderful you couldn't expect to get anywhere without making use of it. And yet radio has a wonderful property that everyone can listen to the radio. Okay. So cryptography suddenly emerged as the only security technique applicable to a broad range of things. Uh, suppose it hadn't emerged? It's hard to imagine how it could not have emerged, but certainly that would have created, oh, I'm trying to put this. Look, if you look at signals intelligence, the expensive part of it has to do with collecting the signals, right? Mm -hmm. So NSA and GCHQ have a budget of billions of dollars or pounds for stations around the world that are listening to the radio. Right? And even if the radio, and I don't know, I have a current figure, but most of the world's communications in the past weren't encrypted. Now, that might actually have changed with transport layer security and, and various things that have been done with satellite communications and so forth. But I remember talking years ago to a, to a cryptographer and information theorist, Melvin Burlakamp, who said some, some of that, he gave a figure around 90% for unencrypted communications. It could well have been 99. Now, so lots of things that are, and of course, wait, look at telephones, right? For decades, I mean, very little telephone traffic is encrypted. It's, it adds an, I mean, yes, if it's cell phone traffic, pieces of it are encrypted. More for the use of the provider, not exactly for the protection of the individual. So, would there be intelligence sources that there are not because of encryption? Yes. Would that transform the world? Hard to know. Mm. And I think that basically we are entering, my, I've been trying to say we are entering a golden age of surveillance. <clears throat> yep. Because one, the foremost issue in the growth of signals intelligence is how much communicating they do. And, uh, you know, exaggerate that only slightly, things that were moving securely by camelback in the Middle East 50 years ago are now going by satellite, right? Now, if they were going by camelback, the signals intelligence people can't possibly get them. You've got to, you know, ride out there and grab a camel or something. Whereas now... 
There are satellites in orbit listening. There are gr other ground stations listening, etc. So the more they move their stuff into satellite channels or people move their stuff into uh a sub, into smartphone, you know, cellular, mobile phone channels, or especially as in lots of areas, you get what, what's called fish, fixed position cellular telephony because it's cheaper to use radios and run wires. Now, all sorts of things are opening up to, uh, to interception. And the artificial intelligences can put these things together and figure them out. Uh, there was a wonderful talk some years ago at the Center for International Security and Cooperation I'm affiliated with down on campus. But somebody was showing how to correlate uh, satellite photos with picture with with other sources, and had some particular place in the Middle East where there was a military facility that following the archaeological principle that good, good occupation sites are good occupation sites and they stay occupied for thousands of years, it's right next to a crusader fort. And the crusader fort had lots of tourists, and the tourists took pictures of everything, and they put the pictures up on the web. And so now you can, off the web, these are, these are so to speak, open sources, right? Off the web now you can get lots of ground pictures taken in the direction of this military facility, and you can correlate them with the satellite photographs that you can get of this facility, and you get a good deal of information out of it. So, I mean, I think the same things that mean that individuals can't protect information about themselves very well these days because the web is watching us, right, means that nobody can. And uh, the fact that our governments can keep secrets from us doesn't mean they can keep them from each other. Wow. Okay, now my other kind of big question. I've heard you talk about this before. Um, quantum computing, mm. is it a big myth or is it a real threat? <laughs> I, I remember a line in a, uh, in a book called Wise Guy, and anybody who doesn't know, about a man named Henry Hill, who was a, an Irish, I think his father was Irish, but his mother was Italian. He lived in Brownsville, East New York. But in some meeting, somebody said, this is a matter among the Italians. Everybody understood the Italians were the bosses of that mob. Uh, and I think of this, this is a matter among the physicists. They've been promising this for 30 years. Right? That's not the longest of promising controlled fusion for 100, 100 maybe? No, 90, 90. Certainly, they were they were working at it already in 1930. Um, but so, I don't know I, wh whether quantum computing is going to, you know, break all of break public key cryptography. I don't know, but certainly a lot of money seems to think there's 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 a lot in that direction, and that's really all I all I know about it. Um, there's a big project to develop, quote, post-quantum cryptography. Mm -hmm. And just for Larry, the quantum, quantum computing won't break a, a lot of cryptography. It has very little effect on something like the advanced encryption standard or SHA-2, any of these, any of the things other than Diffie-Hellman and RSA-type systems that depend on hidden cycle lengths and Shor's algorithm the one big thing people know how to compute with in quantum computing, um, or no, would know how to compute with if they had quantum computers to compute with it on, uh, it breaks the currently popular public key crypto systems. Now, if that comes through, the problem is that the replacements are all much more expensive. And that's all I really know about it. Uh, the advantage of having key negotiation be cheap is as to what you can get what's called forward secrecy, which means that you negotiate keys afresh based on newly generated random numbers for each communication you have. And that way, if somebody gets the keys from one of them, that doesn't tell them anything about another one. Right. Okay. But lots of things would work, you know, and maybe... Maybe from some points of view, more from some people's points of view, more successfully, even without that. 
Are there any unsolved, significant unsolved problems in cryptography? I assume there are, but are there? Yes. What's I that? mean, all right, so what are the... Oh, so let me sort of run through a list. Of course, the great problem that none of us made any progress on is proof that uh, an adequate theory of computational complexity that allows you to prove that cryptographic systems are secure. And there are all sorts of relative proofs that show, oh, well, this can be reduced to that, and people have been working on that for a long time. The famous that is factoring, for example. And so we think this must be secure because if you could break this, then you could break that, and people have... But the no, there are no solid proofs, and I'm not even sure there is a solid statement that the terms in which the theorems should be stated are really clear yet. And people, you know, there's a there's an old aphorism about a policeman comes along and finds some guy searching under the round under the traffic light and says, you know, what's wrong? He says, I lost my car keys. He says, where did you lose them? Oh, somewhere over there. He points off into the darkness. And he says, why are you looking here? He says, the light's better here. Right? And we do, people do a lot of that. So all people, you know, talking about NP complexity and stuff like that, they're, they're trying to apply what they happen to know about. Well, that's really the right, you know, it doesn't appear to be the right theory to apply to cryptography. It's an infinitistic theory and it comes down to it. All the cryptographic systems at any given instant are, are entirely finite. Um, so that's the, the grand problem that shows no signs of having made a lot of progress over my career on the subject. Um, the glittering problems these days, well, one of them is this issue of post-quantum encryption. Mm -hmm. right? Are there perhaps entirely different, you know, there are sort of two or three popular ways of building systems that don't appear to be vulnerable to quantum computing. So people are working on those. Uh, are there any Utterly different approaches? I don't, I, I suspect there are, but I don't know. Um, what's called homomorphic encryption is a, is, a, is a partially solved problem. Homomorphic encryption is the wonderful notion that I have something and I don't have enough, you know, I can't compute on it for one reason or another. Uh, but you can, but I don't want to tell you what it is. So how am I going to get your help? And the answer is, well, I can encrypt it. And you won't be able to understand it, but you will be able to encrypt on, be able to compute on what on the cryptogram I send you. So you sit there and compute on your cryptogram for a while, and then you know, you send it back to me, and I can't, I can't have done those computations, but I can decrypt it. Mm -hmm. And there were examples of this before, before recently, before the last ten years, and that are very satisfying. So you imagine. That you need you need exponentiation, which is an expensive arithmetic operation, in order to do something like a signature. So you have a smart card, and it doesn't you know have much computational capacity, and you're going to put it into a slot, and it wants to get something done without giving its secret to the slot, and so it masks what it wants done, and sends it to the slot which then can do a compute compute on the masked item and then send it back, right? And can be unmasked and exported as a final value. So you have an untrusted coprocessor for, for a signature device on a smart card. Well, the idea is to do that much more generally, and that's what homomorphic encryption does, and it's made a surprising amount of progress uh, over the last decade or so but not enough, and it's not clear whether it will make it enough, enough to make up for just raw not having enough computing power. Right? So if you want to do a monster, you know, hydrocode numeric computation of some kind or other, and you want to get your, your computing from Amazon Web Services, then... You know, can you really do that more cheaply than buying your own computer if you have to do homomorphic encryption on everything? I think the answer is no. There's a factor of a million in cost. On the other hand, a man named Drew Dean, while he was at ARPA, 
put on a wonderful demonstration because he happened to find a problem. This is wonderful because I, he didn't know this was a great classic ComSec problem. And it's called the problem of a black conference bridge. So, you know, if we have a bunch of secure phones and want to have a, a multi-person teleconference, well, the classic way of doing it is we all call the same spot, which is called a red conference bridge, red meaning it holds secret information, and it decrypts all the phones and mixes the voices together and re-encrypts the stuff and sends it back out. And that's no problem for MOD or DOD. They own lots of property to put a secure system on. But if you were a startup with five people, you know, and one's in Hong Kong and one's in Paris and one's here and things like that, then how would you hold a secure conference? And he put on a demonstration using homomorphic encryption using iPhone 5s and Amazon Web Services because it just happens that those voice mixing algorithms are things that work uh, with the homomorphic encryption techniques we have. All right, so that's that's another very important problem. There are very, um, there are so to speak classic problems that are related. The fact that their problems are related to the problems about proving that crypto systems are good. If you look at the advanced encryption standard, of which I am a great fan, because it was developed. U.S. government held a a worldwide contest to select it, and then. Unique, you know, when, there are a lot of things I'm not proud of in the U.S., but I'm proud of this one. They selected a Belgian algorithm to be the U.S. standard. And that Belgian algorithm, there's more to it than that because a key element of it is Finnish, due to a woman named Kaiser Nyberg. So we have, you know, it has real claim to being an international development effort. Um that algorithm is moderately expensive to run. And so, you know, it would be very nice if you had something that was just as secure, but so to speak, ran a hundred times as fast or used a hundred times as le less power or used a hundred times as many gates, a hundredth as many gates. So there's that kind of ordinary performance problem about which people have intuitions about how many gate delays per bit you need to have in order to encrypt at securely, but nobody knows for sure. Right. So that's a very classic sort of problem. And then, of course, you know, in your domain, I think there's a tremendous amount that's open about blockchain sort of systems and proof of stake, proof of work, proof of this, that, and the other, and how to get them to scale and operate uh, smoothly. And I guess I think you'd have to call those cryptographic problems. And there are another class of problems. I mean, if I think, I think it would be worthwhile to work on. I've only done a little. Um, I wish my community would do more work on them. There are, for example... The um, the bombs at Bletchley Park could only break Enigma traffic by guessing at probable texts and then verifying whether one whether two things were true, whether something was the right key or the right piece of the key, and if they were correct about what probable text underlay what they were doing. They didn't have a pure statistical technique uh, for just looking at ciphertext and analyzing it. I live 30 minutes from Bletchley Park. Okay. Right near me. Hmm? It's right near me. <laughs> well, that's interesting because you said you were near Cambridge and it's usually described as being hard to get to from Cambridge. Well, if you like... But that's probably by rail. I mean, by, I imagine yeah. uh, by, by car. By car, 30 I, minutes, yeah. I'm, uh, about th I'm about 30 minutes from Cambridge, about 30 minutes from Bletchley, about 30 minutes from London. They kind of sit in the middle of all of them. How nice. Yeah. You're still working today? Sorry? You're still working. Oh, I am. You've not retired. No. What are you working on? Um, well, several things. Most prominent is an operation called Cryptic Labs, which is a service organization of the blockchain industry. Okay. So we, we in effect, do blockchain consulting, but not in the form usually of hourly consulting, but of having partners who, to whom our services are available. But we also do a lot about helping people find find personnel and um, 
work on work internally on problems of interest to the blockchain community. Okay. So this is only about a year old, and we're still you know trying to figure out how we can be most useful. Wow, this has been fantastic. It's been a really, really enjoyable interview. Um, you got any closing thoughts? Anything you want to say? Other than say that I'm thirsty or something? <laughs> um, no, I think mm. you've really drawn me out quite nicely. I give all credit to the interviewers. Uh, uh, not- and uh, this again, you know, you've, you've, of course, you've just let me go on and hold forth, uh, but. Uh, the result has uh, flowed by quite smoothly. I, do you know what? It, it always comes down to the guest. The guest makes the, the interview what it okay, is. Okay, I, I have the opposite point of view. I think, yeah. the, I think the interviewer makes the interview. And now, of course, from the point of view of an interviewer, that has to be – our points of view are, are, are built into our positions. Right. Because I like some of my interviews and don't like others as well, and therefore I attribute it to the variance in – in interviewers, you like some interviews better and some less, yeah. and the thing that you're always the same, so you attribute it to the variation of guests. Well, then we have to compromise and say it, it takes two to tango. If, if it's a good interview, it's both of us. <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's a no brainer answer. Well, do you know what I think it is? I think two people can make a good interview; one person can ruin it. You know, of one course. person can ruin on their own. But look, this has been utterly Probably fantastic. Probably true of a marriage also. <laughs> a dance. Let's not, I don't want to get A into, dinner. Let's not get this uh-huh. with marriage. <laughs> okay, uh, this has been great. A, a war. This would be a great war if it weren't for the other side. Yeah. <laughs> a legal case. Yeah, well, that's like crypto Twitter that you're not part of, but that is a war zone. Like, crypto people are fighting constantly. Well, wait a minute. In what... Uh, Differences of opinion. Have you heard of the Bitcoin maximalists? No. So the Bitcoin maximalist believes Bitcoin is the only uh, cryptocurrency of value because of a number of reasons. And they don't like Ethereum. They don't like Zeek. They don't, don't think anything else has any value. So there's a war generally between Bitcoiners and people who like Ethereum. Okay. No, right. so that's like any other, so to speak, uh, industrial competition. You have two, two products in the same space. I guess so, yeah, yeah. Well, anyway, I think everyone's going to love this interview. I think I'm going to rush back now to LA and get this out tomorrow because sometimes <laughs> you record one, you're just like, I just want to get it out there. Um, Wit, thank you so much. You're most welcome. Okay, so what did you make of that? How amazing is Whitfield? It was just so cool to sit back with him, listen to all his stories about the early days of cryptography. Honestly, I couldn't have enjoyed this interview anymore. And also, it's really cool to hear his thoughts on Bitcoin and some of the work he's still doing. He's still working today. He's still working on various projects. And it was, yeah, I just absolutely love this interview. I probably could have sat with him for like half a day and talked through some of his old stories about the early days of cryptography and some of the things he was working on. I think it's really important that we do pay respect to some of the people who built the foundations for what Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies have been built upon. And yeah, I love doing this. It was awesome. And yeah, if you've got any questions about the show, do reach out to me. And again, I want to thank everyone who supports the show. I've just finished the audit for January. Downloads are up over 120,000 this month, which is amazing. Revenue's up 35%. I will be putting the income report on my website as soon as I've got back to London and done that. But listen, if you want to support the show, there's a whole bunch of things you can do. And as I always say, please do listen to the sponsors because without sponsors, I don't have a show. So don't just skip past them. Or if you don't want to listen to the sponsors, head over to Patreon, sign up for $5 a month. You can get each show without the advertising. That is patreon.com forward slash what Bitcoin did. If you don't want to use Patreon, you can subscribe with crypto. Just email me. I'll give you an address to send to you and you can be added to the distribution list. You also might want to be a show sponsor. If you're interested in that, you can email me on hello at whatbitcoindid.com. As you just heard, downloads are over 120,000 this month. So if you want to reach new audiences, drop me a line. We can talk about that you can leave me a review on itunes or you can click the subscribe button both help with the ranking in itunes you can follow me on social media i'm at what bitcoin did on everything on medium on twitter on instagram but my personal twitter is at peter mccormack dms are always open feel free to reach out to me you can check out my website doing lots more work on that that's www.whatbitcoindid.com i'm redoing my training course at the moment i'm making a bit more bitcoin focus hopefully that will be out in the next month and you can sign up to my newsletter there as well and lastly you can share the show out with your friends and family so i'm flying back to london in a few hours 
I just want to say a big thank you to everyone who's helped me out on this trip. Thanks to Tony Vazer's conference, which was amazing. Thank you to Peter Todd for coming on the show. Everyone I met in Vegas. And thank you to Suna for her hospitality up in San Francisco. I've got some great shows recorded. I just need to get back to London and get my schedule together. Anyway, listen, I hope you all have a great weekend. And if you want to reach out to me, my email address is hello at whatbitcoindid.com. 